no further ado, uh, I would like to invite back to the stage the Commander of Air Mobility Command, General Mike Minahan. All right, admin, I would like to congratulate the University of Arkansas for their victory over Auburn today. I would also like to remind them how good I was as a victor when we were pounding the crap out of Arkansas back in the day. So uh, that is a good victory. I would be remiss if I didn't uh, declare that the formation is whole and that General Fogelman is in the house. Chief, we are so glad to have you here. Women's Leadership Forum yesterday, and uh, we declared that really a Legends Forum. And spiritually, it had our next speaker in it yesterday, but physically, we have her today. So you deserve both the title of Legend and Pioneer, and it is a distinct honor uh, for me to introduce to do, introduce you today, ma'am. I've had the good fortune uh, to follow her twice in command, so I know well when there's a, a phrase out there that says uh, "follow in the footsteps of giants." I know exactly what that means. But if you will please give the next speaker, General Jackie Van Ovos, a warm ATA welcome for a legend, a mobility legend, and a pioneer, and my commander, my boss, an honor, ma'am, to have you here. Welcome. Hello, Airlift and Tanker Association. Woo! All right, now at 2.30 in the afternoon, what can get you more pumped than a little ACDC? <laughs> Minnie, thank you for that great introduction. I'm sure the audience is super psyched. You're gonna not going to read my whole bio, which is awesome. Um, thanks also to General McNabb, sir, uh, for the opportunity to speak today and for your, your years of service and leadership and dedication uh, as chairman. I also want to shout out to Chief BK uh, and Chief Williams. Thank you for your leadership and your friendship. Uh, General Selva, General Everhard, of course, Chief, thank you, sir, for coming. Uh, it's great to see everyone. And of course, my shipmate, Fleet Myrick, where are you at? There you are. My wingman and shipmate. Uh, love you, thank you so much. All right, I know these conventions are a heavy lift, so let me add to the thanks of, on behalf of all of us today to, a, uh, to ATA, AMC, and our industry partners for this world-class forum. So, mobility teammates, such a pleasure to join you as we honor 75 years of legacy and we celebrate the accomplishments of the award winners in this entire enterprise and engage in discussions about our future. Now, I've attended ATA a few times in my career and while listening to the key, keynotes is pretty important, some of the best conversations always have it, happen with a cool beverage in your hand and a little stiff competition. So I think Chief BK and I are the only ones between you and, and that final competition tonight, so we'll, we'll get on with it. It is hard to believe that it's already been one year since I've left AMC and joined the Transcom leadership team. Standing in front of you, in front of Orlando last year, we had just completed the largest non-combatant evacuation operation in history. Having witnessed all of your incredible efforts, I am proud of AMC's work to capture and recognize those significant accomplishments. This is part of the legacy that you will share with your children and your grandchildren. As members of our air component, each of you, the total force men and women of Air Mobility Command and our industry partners, continue to provide the capability to deliver hope and lethality around the world whenever our nation calls. Today, our joint logistical prowess remains on full display as we balance the rigors of our global mission while ensuring that Ukraine receives the aid it needs to defend its country. In this competitive international environment, we will need your experience, your innovation, and your partnership now more than ever to evolve our rapid strategic maneuver advantage. 
Watching Russia struggle to supply their forces in their front yard, I'll bet that President Putin wishes he had mobility experts just like you. Transcom recently celebrated our 35th anniversary. And after over three decades of operations, there is one constant. We must remain our, with our readiness to fight tonight while ensuring our ability to do so into the future. In fact, General Dwayne Cassidy, a previous MAC commander, ATA Hall of Famer, and first Transcom commander, understood this fact better than anyone. So if you're not familiar, young Lieutenant Cassidy began his journey as a mobility navigator and then earned his pilot's wing uh, and began to fly bombers in SAC. Returning to the fold, Cassidy commanded an airlift squadron, a wing, and a numbered air force. Throughout his distinguished career, he accumulated over 8,000 flying hours, where he supported multiple operations around the world, including Vietnam, Lebanon, and Grenada. His experiences led him to believe that air mobility creates windows of opportunity in time and space to deliver forces that can deter or defeat our potential threats. And he was right. The responsiveness and range of air mobility forces clearly creates options for our combatant commanders. For Cassidy, this was only possible through the flexibility of our people, the quality of our support and maintenance structure, and the precision of our command and control. With those things in place, he knew that commercial and military capacity could make all the difference. That's why he was such an early proponent of the C-17, a weapon system he championed from initial concept and a staunch supporter of the relationship with our commercial partners. In fact, I just ran into his son, Colonel Retired Mike Cassidy, who was up here earlier, who's carrying on his great legacy. In 1987, two days before Transcom's formal activation ceremony, Cassidy spoke to a group of military and commercial industry leaders, just like this one. As our country engaged in strategic competition with a former global power, he detailed the actions necessary for building a sophisticated logistics organization. One imperative he identified for our then fledgling combatant command was to develop a robust distribution system. A system that, as he described, would revolutionize the logistics of our nation by providing the right information to those who will determine if we must fight, to those who will lead the fight, and when called, deliver those who must fight. So from our inception, this enterprise was created to provide our senior leaders a decision advantage and deliver our nation's forces around the world in peace and war. As a mobility pioneer, Cassidy had a significant impact on our expanding role of air mobility and joint logistics. The results of his influence and vision remain relevant today. He accurately pre predicted that our efforts will set benchmarks against which future change will be considered, implemented, or discarded. So strategic adaptation is part of our legacy from the collapse of the Soviet Union to Desert Storm, through natural disaster relief, operational surges, retrogrades, pandemics, and even supply chain congestion. Air mobility and our commercial partners have always led the way. We must do so again. Together in the last year, we demonstrated the impact a dedicated logistics organization can have on global operations. We did so in a manner much different than the preceding years, with cargo and the destinations not forecasted, and at a pace and scale that no other enterprise could replicate. And while I believe the capabilities inherent in our network exceed the foresight of General Cassidy, it's our resilient warfighting team that continues to represent the difference between victory and defeat, and in many cases, life or death. A little over a month ago, Transcom's Patient Movement Requirements Center received an urgent call. A four-year-old at Guam's U.S. Naval Hospital had a heart issue that required immediate surgery back in CONUS. Coordinating through the 618th and 613th AOCs, the Air Medical Network sprang into action. The pediatric ICU team from Brooks Army Medical Center in Texas was immediately sent to Guam. From there, and on board a C-17, they worked alongside a Kadena-based AE crew to get the patient and his family to Hickam. Meanwhile, a C-17 crew out of Travis 
carrying a second AE team, was alerted and rushed to meet the patient in Hawaii. Waiting to receive the relief crew, the ICU team, and the patient was a KC-135. The new crew and aircraft delivered the precious cargo and the medical teams to Navy's North Island Medical Center in San Diego, where he underwent successful, life-saving surgery. Notification to movement occurred in 26 hours and involves significant complexities. Synchronization of critical care and AE teams, multiple command and control nodes, transmoding into different airframes, cabin altitude restrictions in flight, and intense patient care, that including the need to resuscitate the toddler. In our profession, nothing is more fulfilling than delivering aid or transporting someone to safety. Air Mobility's unique AE capability allows us to achieve effects by saving lives. The lengths we will go to for our service members and their family is simply unmatched. I could not be prouder of the teams that made such challenging missions look routine. Let's give our AE teams a round of applause. Now the need to save lives remains a vital mission in crisis and conflict, especially against a peer adversary. The increased pace and casualty rate will strain our limited resources and reduce the availability of traditional options. We will need our command and control, AE, and critical care experts to help us develop what a new life-saving network will look like. We may not always have aircraft or AE or CCAT crews available, so we must rehearse different modes of transport and be able to leverage the regional care that our allies and partners can provide. Now, AE is only one aspect of the mobility mission set that makes logistics a critical warfighting function. Few things demonstrate this better than the current events driven by Russia's ongoing threat to regional security in Europe. Before Ukraine's sovereignty was violated, members of this association were already delivering the weapons and equipment that would directly impact events on the battlefield. Due to the expanse of our network, the opportunity to generate strategic results is really not limited to traditional members of the Joint Logistics Enterprise. Helping to match the substantial ammunition requirements of the European theater to our significant capacity were members of Army's Joint Munition Command, located in Rock Island, Illinois. Over the past 10 months, the JMC team coordinated over 3,000 commercial transport trucks. These vehicles traveled from eight different munitions depots to four different airfields. During the largest of the presidentially directed actions, we demonstrated the agility of our network by rapidly shifting departure locations from Tinker to Hill. At the height of this movement, these locations were receiving 40 trucks a day, where our awesome port dogs loaded over 100,000 artillery rounds onto awaiting military and commercial aircraft in 16 days. At Army's East Coast Ammunition Port, Matsu, our surface warrior component, managed rail and truck movements for over 2,000 containers and other combat equipment that they loaded onto commercial vessels. Our Navy Sealift component then command and controlled them into the European ports. But you contributed so much more. And your influence is evident in every aspect of this operation. To reinforce our allies, you deployed tankers, reaction forces, and combat aircraft into theater. To support the flow of requirements, you moved contingency response airmen forward, utilized the expertise of our amazing AMLOs, and leveraged global mobility posture to create resilient distribution nodes and modes. This is how Transcom leverages the entire joint deployment and distribution enterprise, from surface transport to airlift to sea lift, military and commercial. If you've heard of the ammunition, the high Mars, and weapon system utilized by Ukraine on the battlefield today, you were part of the network that got it there. So thank you for all of your significant contributions to our nation's success in the face of authoritarian aggression. Secretary Austin and General Milley and so many other senior leaders are constantly praising the men and women of this enterprise. Your efforts have not gone unnoticed. We have accomplished so much together in this last year. Take a look.
The Russian military has begun a brutal assault on the people of Ukraine. Without provocation, without justification, without necessity, this is a premeditated attack. I spoke last night to President Zelensky of Ukraine, and I assured him that the United States, together with our allies and partners in Europe, will support the Ukrainian people as they defend their country. The nature of war is often unpredictable, but we are committed, shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine, to ensure they remain a free, independent, and sovereign country. The Transcom team, from our components to our industry partners, underwrites the lethality of the joint force. Since our founding as a combatant command, every Transcom member, past, present, and future, has enabled the execution of our nation's strategic objectives. The nationwide baby formula shortage is reaching a critical state in some areas, but the Biden administration says help is on the way. We must be ready now and in the future. As a warfighting command, Transcom is focused on delivering the needs of the Joint Force regardless of the environment. Our fight tonight mentality drives us to evolve in the face of emerging challenges. Future success will depend on our logistics prowess. And turning now to the country of Pakistan that has been ravaged by incessant rains and floods since June. Whether we're supporting Ukraine's defense, exercising capabilities around the world, or providing humanitarian assistance, our military and commercial partners continue to meet global strategic mobility requirements necessary to deliver troops, food, water, and hope, wherever and whenever. What you do matters, and I'm grateful for your service and commitment to our nation, because together we deliver. is on the way. As we look to the future, we must ensure that we learn the correct lessons from our successes. Where and how we apply our expertise will be different, and we must ready ourselves for whatever is next. In the President's recently released national security strategy, he made it clear that China and Russia are working overtime to undermine democracy and export a model of governance marked by repression at home and coercion abroad. Geopolitically, China remains our most consequential strategic competitor. Holistically, they have shaped their instruments of national power to erode, disrupt, or destroy our ability to oppose their revisionist aspirations. And just as the original Transcom commander did all those years ago, I stand before you as our country once again engages in strategic global competition. This is not new territory for the men and women of this enterprise. As General Brown says, we've been here before. To meet national defense objectives, we must adopt the mentality that challenge is not synonymous with impossible and contested is not the same as impenetrable. Yes, we will have to fight to get to the fight, but we will get there. This is a component of the warrior heart the AMC commander is so passionate about. In the expanse of the Pacific, our predecessors utilized their capabilities to overcome the threats that they faced, and we will do the same. Significant opportunities exist to exploit our expertise to deploy, maneuver, and sustain the joint force. 
With this in mind, and to ensure we uh, remain ready now and into the future, we have released our command strategy that's focused on evolving our strategic advantage. Now, General Minahan earlier leaned into me as, as Chief Bass was talking to me, and, and he asked me about what the square was on, on her slide, and I didn't have a chance to tell him that, so I just want to tell him that now. Just, just uh, That's called a QR code, so just <laughs> open your iPhone if you have one and uh, point a camera at that bad boy. Um, but I will leave the inspirational execution of that over to you. Now, many, I know you understand better than anyone to compete uh, effectively. We must have agile, resistant, survivable, and sustainable forces. And I can't think of anyone better suited to deliver unrepentant lethality. Let's go. Let's go. Now, your efforts in the last year has very clearly demonstrated uh, mobility's contribution to the national defense strategy's ways of integrated deterrence, campaigning, and building enduring advantage. With AMC's strategy fully aligned with TRANSCOMS, our priorities and warfighting framework enable these key concepts. Together, the capabilities we deliver underwrite the lethality of the joint force. Integrated deterrence is predicated on making the adversary doubt that they can achieve their objective. And every day, you reinforce their uncertainty. And you send a clear message. Today is not the day. Whether you're supporting alert forces for nuclear and defense of the homeland missions, enabling the projection of combat power, leveraging access provided by our allies and partners to deliver cargo, or enabling the diplomatic efforts of our most senior leaders, the speed and reach at which you execute the mission is something that our competitors must contend with. This includes the operations of commercial industry, whose capacity drastically expands our ability to scale in response to joint force requirements. Their series of contacts and contracts around the world further complicate adversary decision cycles while freeing military capacity to build readiness. For example, of the over 850 flights delivering lethal aid to Ukraine, 60% were executed by our commercial partners. With our global posture and mobility capacity, we continuously present credible options to senior leaders for delivering fuel, munitions, maintenance support, and material anywhere in the world. We must ensure that this is always the case, regardless of the environment. To campaign effectively, we must continually rehearse the concepts and capabilities necessary to aggregate the forces to fight and disaggregate to survive in degraded and denied battle spaces. The complexity of contested operations will place increased requirements on the contributions of rapid global mobility and what you provide to the joint scheme of maneuver. Successful exploitation of these capabilities demands that we empower the total force, commercial and our allies and partners, to develop innovative solutions. I applaud General Minahan's vision and expansion of Mobility Guardian 23 that when combined with our other joint exercises, we'll put a premium on closing the operational gaps and developing concepts that will grow competitor doubt. Our detailed analyses proves that there will be no single service solution. So strengthening multimodal capabilities that link inter and intra-theater airlift with fast sea lift and surface operations is an imperative. We will match the speed, threat, and desired effect to ensure that we can deliver from the homeland to the last 1,000 tactical miles. Timing, tempo, and scale will necessitate that we focus on building these enduring advantages that integrate the joint force through dynamic command and control. To do so, we have to treat data as a strategic asset, one that acts uh, as a decision enabler through purposeful design of systems that will allow us to sense, make sense, and decide faster at all echelons of maneuver. Through robust data analytics and secure communications and connections, we can drive knowledge to the lowest level to create decision advantage. On our commercial and military platforms, this will require integration into JADC2 constructs, battle networks, 
advanced encrypted communications and reliable navigation. We will be linked into the distributed command and control nodes and resourced with the tools that enable rapid decision making. Make no mistake, this is a deliberate shift towards del delivering requirements preemptively and proactively during opportunities of domain superiority, better known as push logistics. Finally, any digital advantage is untenable if it's not adequately trusted and protected. That's why driving cyber domain mission assurance remains a top priority. Resilience in the cyber domain directly translates to agility in every other. And because it's only through secure, reliable, and agile C2 that we'll be able to apply our scarce resources to the joint requirements at a pace and scale necessary to prevail. The enduring advantages we build today reinforce integrated deterrence and reduce the possibility of conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, the responsibility before us is significant, but that is nothing new for this enterprise. Throughout our combined history, we have always risen to meet our nation's strategic challenges. Our legacy is filled with those who met difficulty with innovation, determination, and professionalism. Time after time, when our nation called, we delivered. This has only been possible because we've recognized that the development of our people is inseparable from the growth of our organizations. Not fully understanding the impact of this most valuable resource has led to disaster for other governments, for other militaries, and dare I say, companies. In the complexities of this decisive decade, you are the ones that will ensure that we can compete now and into the future. What you have done and continue to do every day matters, but don't take my word for it. Those who directly witnessed your impacts can explain it, well, better than I ever could. Hello, everybody from Brussels, Belgium. I'm Chris Cavoli. I command U.S. European Command, and I'm the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. First, I'd like to thank General Van Ovos for the opportunity to speak to you today, because I am truly grateful for all the work that you do for this command. U.S. European Command depends heavily on reinforcement, and so you, the transportation enterprise and the Department of Defense, is critical to all of our plans and all of our operations. More than that, though, I'm responsible to deliver to the Alliance U.S. forces. So you are the people who do that. Not only are you supporting U.S. European Command every day, you're supporting the entire NATO alliance. And therefore, you're supporting the security of Europe and the United States of America. So thank you for everything that you do. Your professionalism, your dedication, and your unmatched capabilities are truly world class. My name is Alexandra Zarkina. I'm a deputy minister of the Ministry of Infrastructure. And I would like to say a few words for the work you're doing and the work we're doing all together. From the first days of this terrible war, my team was deeply engaged in the process of the international logistics. And from behalf of the team and a whole Ukrainian people, I want to thank the men and women of US Transcom, their components, and all the commercial industry partners who have supported the defense and independence of Ukraine. The weapons, munitions, and supplies you deliver to the people and armed forces of Ukraine have saved countless lives. I just recently was in liberated Izum, Balaklia. Before I was in the Sumo region, myself, I have a house in the Bucha suburbs. And it's truly not much words needed to understand the value of the job you're doing. Because it's not about some processes, it's about the results and possibility to make a huge difference in this terrible war. I'm looking forward for the next deliveries, for the next cooperation projects, and really we're grateful. And we do hope to finish this war as soon as possible, to win this war, but to be even more connected than ever before. Slava Ukraine. Slava Ukraine. Help is on 
the way. I want to leave you with one final thought from the founding commander of Transca. As he reflected on the importance of this gathering of professionals and the capabilities we provide for our nation, he said, it's up to us to come up with new ideas. Ours is a nation dependent on transportation. We're realizing that fact now more than ever, and it's time for us to get on with it. Dwayne Cassidy's words resonate just as much today as they did in 1987. If we commit ourselves to the change necessary, 35 years from now, my future successor will profess how our generation promoted peace, security, and global prosperity. Our time is now, the stakes are high, and success depends on us. Together, we deliver. time for a few questions. Great. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, maybe the last one that we got. Uh, what is Transcom's plan to address cargo delivery to the last contested mile and dynamically move cargo between the non-runway forward operating locations? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, we are not going to be operating as freely uh, as we have today, right? Uh, as much as Kabul was contested as much as uh, Poland is contested. Uh, it's, it's not going to be anything like what we expect out in the Pacific. So we've come to the conclusion that air cannot do it all, but it must do a lot, and a lot more than it's doing right now. We have to have a combination of air, fast sea lift, autonomous bar barges, land transportation, the use of our allies and partners' capabilities uh, within, their, in, within their islands, ferries. Right, we have to put it all together in the Pacific. But we've got to convince a joint force and provide capabilities for the joint force so that they are sustainable. They've got to be smaller packets. They've got to go forward with just what they need. And then we have to be there if they, if they need a critical part. And that's really going to be a lot of air. So we'll work it together. We'll go out there and exercise and get those reps and sets. We'll move, we'll do multimodal solutions during your exercises so that you can learn that if you, uh, if you get white carded or uh, told that an airfield is out, you have to go to another airfield where there's a seaport and you're gonna offload your stuff onto a barge. Right? Uh, our ground personnel, our port dogs, our, our folks that work the, the terminals uh, and the seaports, we all have to work it together with our surface and maritime components. So it, it will be a, a little more complex than it is right now, but it's not undoable. Right? It can be done. And the most important thing, though, is to get confidence and to exercise it in the theater. And that's what these exercises coming up are meant to do. Mobility Guardian will still see a little bit of that. And we're working very closely uh, with our allies and partners in the Pacific to try to tag on to their capabilities, to include you know, commonality, uh, commonality in equipment, commonality in Ammunition, as we're learning in, with Ukraine, that somebody's 155 doesn't fit in another 155 uh, 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 material. So we'll need to work on that together. Uh, but we can do it, right? We can do it. Ma'am, this next question uh, builds on the answer that you just gave uh, regarding our allies. Uh, and the question is, what can we expect from our allies and partners to contribute with capacity and capability in a high-end fight with China? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, here's what you can expect. Nations act in their own interests. We talk about what's the Venn diagram uh, between uh, what it is that uh, you know, the US, what our interests are, perhaps what their coalition or alliance interests are, and what different partners, what their interests are. Okay, let's just say simply where you sit, where you stand, right? What, what is going on in your country? And how, how much can you participate? Here's, here's, the, here's the truth of what we know. In the NATO alliance, we've been working together for so long. And beyond the NATO alliance, we have over 52 countries right now are supporting Ukraine. So that's beyond just the alliance and EU. So when we have common, right, if we can be transparent and share intelligence, right, 
and we know, you know, what what their what their uh, governments are interested in, and how then if we work together and we build that trust at both at a military level and an economic level, that we will be there for them, right? That's that's the more that, that's when the Venn diagram starts to collude a little more. And we start to have the same objectives. So you can expect that allies, treaty allies, are going to be treaty allies, uh, and they'll be with us. But everything else is going to be interest-based. So as we do these exercises and we go to different locations, uh, we have to bring, you know, a, uh, you know, what's our proposition, right? What's our value proposition? Why do they want to partner with us? You know, and, and, ba and basically we look at it from a military lens, and not just a military lens. It's economic, it's informational, it's diplomatic, all of that. So it really depends on how a uh, near peer fight, how a high-end fight actually starts to evolve. Who struck first? What's the information environment? To, who, who knows what is the truth? And who comes to the truth and, and looks at democracy and liberty, right? And the values and hold up values, and then they'll make their own decision. So we, we have to be ready for uh, any of the wild cards, which is what I say, you may have somebody that you're exercising with today but they may not be a part of it in the future. I'm, I'm heartened with what's going on with Ukraine because of all the different nations that have come behind, but not every nation has gotten behind this sort of coalition of the willing. Uh, so, and I suspect it'll be the same way with any conflict. And of course, my phone just refreshed, ma'am. So uh, just give me a second here. Sure. Uh, this this uh, question comes from uh, Senior Master Sergeant Sean Hasty. Uh, and the, the senior's question is, considering the overwhelming force flow required for O-Plan execution to get to the fight, how do we close the time gap of delivery and eliminate the early to need problem set? Thank you. Yeah, senior, I think on the, um, yeah, the early to need problem set, I th at the strategic level, that is probably one of the most vexing things. What does the joint force commander need and in what time frame? And, it, and things change, right? And then as the Joint Force Commander wants some things and wants to do a, a particular branches of the plan that has to be you know, approved through the Secretary of Defense. So the, the most important thing is that really since, uh, since Afghanistan, the Secretary of Defense has, has run these meetings where we actually get more touches with him uh, frequently in the week so that we can understand the battle rhythm as it unfolds, so we can understand the Secretary's priorities, the President's priorities, and the Joint Force Commander's priorities, so we can make those priority decisions on what lift to allocate and at what time. Of course, we always provide, we try to provide multiple options, and you know, you can, you can bring it, you can really bring it with a ship, but a ship doesn't get there until 15 days. So if you can wait, that may be more effective and save the air for those, you've got to do it within a certain time period. As we do these exercises and as we evaluate the O-plans, uh, we provide our best military advice back to the Joint Force Commander and we say, well, if you want all of this on the third day, you're not going to get it all. We don't have as much, as much lift to do all of that. So what are your priorities? And, and those will start to flesh out. But they'll be conflicting, right? Because there won't be just one commander. Northcom and Stratcom, Homeland Defense, is the number one priority. So there will always be this yin and the yang across the globe as we manage our priorities, which is why we have to have assured command and control. We ought to be able to see the battle space and understand where the joint force is maneuvering, right? What are those options for joint force maneuver? And how are we augmenting that? How are we helping them? And then how are we sustaining them in, into the theater? So it, it's an elaborate dance. Uh, but I can tell you, uh, we have a large exercise coming up, and I, I, as I spoke to the secretary, I said, we're going to play it real, like real assets. Assets, for example, you know, some, some of the C-130Hs are down right now. We're not going to white card any of that. That's not available for the exercise. And we're going to make them come back with their plans and their prioritized plans to move this stuff. Because it's real. We will, we will have real hard discussions on what we have to move. Thanks for that question. Ma'am, how have the current supply chain issues worldwide affected Transcom's ability to deploy rapidly around the world? 
Yeah, thanks. The uh, supply chain congestion, as you know, is not just a, a transcom issue. It is a, it's a global issue. Uh, and it, it, we were starting to have issues even before COVID. COVID really exasperated the situation. And the e-commerce, when that sort of uh, ballooned out, it, it made it even worse. So the good news is uh, we have a lot of patriots. And we, have, uh, we use US carriers, both for ships and for air. Uh, and we get priority. We get priority at the ports. For example, the port of Oakland, the port of Long Beach, where the, we have, there are ships that are lined up outside of that port. Because we're US flagged, uh, we go directly into the port and we don't have to wait. Some of these ships are waiting 14, 30 days out there. So we get priority. But we still, on, when it comes to land and rail, we, we do compete uh, with uh, the rest of the world. On, on moving the goods. And we talk almost uh, every week, our, our, each of our components, with the commercial capacity to try to understand where they need help, can they meet our requirements, can we uh, deploy uh, this particular ABCT in, in this time frame or not. And for the vast majority of the time, they have been able to deliver. Like the rail will pull off some of the commercial stuff and they'll move our, our equipment to meet an exercise timeline. But uh, fast forward, let's think about, let's take that to the future. The future is uh, cyber attacks on our nation, right? Space, concerns about our defense infrastructure, what happens if there is no electricity, you know, uh, at, in, in Seattle? So McCord has no electricity, right? How can we marshal and deploy out of there? That's what we want to take uh, a lesson from this supply chain congestion to see what we learned, who was flexible, how do we become more agile when we have disruption in the flow? Because day one, we will have disruption. So this is training us to look at things differently and again, to continue to provide options. And from rail to surface, surface to rail, air to sea, sea to air. Ma'am, we have time for one more question, and this one I hope is fun for you. Of all the commands you've led, why is the 384th Air Refueling Squadron the best? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Let me just double check this. Uh oh. <laughs> Because we rock, that's why. Best air refueling squadron ever. Yeah, you know, squadron command, what an honor. What an honor to command men and women. And, and uh, that particular time was when we marshaled and headed off to Afghanistan, you know, right when it kicked off after 9-11. And that was just the most rewarding time. It was the most excruciating time. Uh, we went through all that pressure together uh, we had amazing spouses and families. Uh, and so when we think about cohesive units, you know, this is about every squadron. I want everyone to feel that they are loved in their squadron, that their leadership, you know, it really wants them to be developed, cares for them. I want you to have the same kind of connections I had at the 384th, no matter what unit you're in. That's what makes it all worth the while. People is the most important resource. When people don't invest in each other, right, that's when things go wrong. That's when you lose the trust. And so I have just been so blessed to be in such amazing, amazing units. But you can never take the heart out of the squares. I thought it was